This is a lecture on equal protection, in particular, the rational basis aspect of equal protection. Now, I assume that you have uh, watched the lecture, the introductory lecture to equal protection, and we know that in equal protection we have these three levels of scrutiny, strict scrutiny, middle tier, and rational basis. And this lecture is about the rational basis. Now, what I'm going to do in this lecture is first I'm going to tell you what the rules are about using rational basis in equal protection. We're going to recite the rules, and then we're going to look at lots of examples, real life examples, where the rational basis test has been used. And that is the best way to become very familiar with what it's going to look like on an examination, because they often choose from these real, almost always, choose from some real life example where there's a real case. Beginning with a summary of what equal protection is really all about is, first of all, when do you apply it? And the answer is that minimal scrutiny, that is a rational basis, minimal scrutiny applies unless strict scrutiny or middle tier scrutiny applies. So really the minimal scrutiny is, is like a default position. And the way you analyze these questions on the bar exam is you look first to see, is there any reason to apply strict scrutiny? And if you say, nope, no reason to apply strict scrutiny. Any reason to apply middle tier? Nope, no reason to apply middle tier. Then you apply rational basis. So it's like the default position. You literally should say that in your examination answer. Secondly, if uh, you are going to use middle tier scrutiny, what is the rule? And the rule is that what we have here now is, let's back up for just a second. Equal protection is really about how you govern if you are running things. How do you govern? And the way you govern is you, you look at the difference in people's behavior. And uh, if, if you then uh, you, you classify people into those who did one behavior and those who did a different, and the losers, you do something bad to the losers and that hopefully gets people to behave the way you want them to. And so the basic rule is that the, 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 the criteria that you use to decide which way you're going to treat people. Someone's over 50, they're under 50, maybe they have to retire if they're over 50. Someone is a striker and they want food stamps, somebody else is not a striker and they want food So you make this distinction and you are the, the people, and the, making this distinction, the distinction, the criteria that you use to form the groups, using those criteria must be a rational way, and then doing something to the losers, must be a rational way to promote the goal, the purpose of the legislation. Once again, uh, you form some criteria for uh, you're going to treat people different on the basis of age, on the basis of whether they're strikers or not, on the basis of, of you know, whatever your basis is. Uh, you, you treat people different on the basis of this and you say, uh, here's what I'm going to do to the losers. And the question is, does that advance or promote the purpose of the statute? Uh, purpose of, of the rule of law. Now, when you do that, the first thing to keep in mind is right here, and that is that the governmental purpose, so far as the court's concerned, will be hypothesized. They, any conceivable governmental purpose will serve this, question, this part right here. It was the government trying to achieve a lawful purpose by this classification scheme, using this criteria where they're trying to achieve a lawful purpose. Well, what was the lawful purpose? Well, the lawful purpose has to be some, if it's a state, the only four things the state can do is to promote health, welfare, safety, and morals. Now, we know that. So anything that the state is trying to advance needs to be traceable back to the state trying to promote health, welfare, safety, and morals. So in the case, for example, of no hired advertising on your truck. You can put your own advertising, but you can't put other people's advertising on your truck. And so the, uh, what is the purpose of that legislation? Well, New York says the purpose was safety. Uh, because with all these signs on trucks, people are watching signs and not watching the traffic. Purpose was safety. Well, that's promoting health, welfare, safety, or morals. So anything that the government does must be uh, an attempt to promote safety. Um, the, in the case of the strikers, uh, strikers who, there were some people on strike, and one of the examples I'll show you, where people on strike wanted food stamps and people who didn't have a job. They, you know, they weren't, had a job in strike and they had no job. And they want food stamps. And so the government made a distinction between these people and they say, 
Uh, one of the government goals is to remain neutral in these private strikes. And if we're going to remain neutral, if we're feeding the strikers, that doesn't look like we're remaining neutral. Well, this government goal, remember this is the federal government now, the federal government goal has to be one of the things that the government, federal government is authorized to do in the Constitution. Commerce Clause is one of them. Labor is within the commerce, is considered a part of commerce. Uh, and so if you want to remain neutral in a private labor strike, that promotes commerce. It promotes you know, the government remaining neutral in the labor strike. Labor is part of commerce, and so it is a way to promote commerce. So always trace the governmental purpose, now whatever it may be, trace it back to, if it's a state, health, welfare, safety, morals, if it's a federal government, trace it back to something the federal government is authorized to do, usually commerce. Now, so uh, the, the strict scrutiny is used when, pardon me, minimal scrutiny is used when strict scrutiny does not apply and middle tier does not apply. The, uh, the rule is that the classification scheme uh, must be rationally related to some lawful governmental purpose. The purpose will be hypothesized. It doesn't matter whether you get what the actual purpose was. Any lawful purpose will be hypothesized by the court. They don't have to get the right. In fact, the, the legislature could have the wrong purpose, and it would still work. Okay, as long as there's a hypothesis, uh, you know, you can. Uh, a, there was a possible lawful purpose. Secondly, that the classification scheme must be rationally related to that purpose. That means that the classification scheme must be a reasonable way to promote that governmental purpose. And here again, the government doesn't have to be correct in the sense that this really would have promoted the, 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 the government purpose. They can be wrong. The question is, well, could, could the legislature have believed at the time that the law was passed that this was a rational way to advance the governmental interest? For example, there's one case in Minnesota where uh, the, the law was you can't put milk in plastic bottles anymore, but you can have milk in cardboard bottles with plastic, you know, coating. Well, and so they thought this was going to promote environmental you know, protection. Well, it turns out when you really did the studies that it became perfectly clear that the legislature had it wrong, that uh, not putting milk in plastic bottles was worse than if you did put it in the plastic bottles. And so, but still the legislature could have uh, rationally believed that this was a rational way to promote uh, environmental uh, uh, protection, which is welfare, health, welfare, safety, morals, probably welfare. Um, and so uh, they could have believed it, and that's sufficient. So the rule is then that if uh, in minimal scrutiny is that the classification scheme, the way you classify people, and, and you treat one of them badly, and by the way, you classify people and you treat one of the groups badly in order to govern. But the group that you treat badly, you must not, if you impair, if you treat them so badly that you impair one of their fundamental rights, okay, the fundamental rights for equal protection purposes are the right to vote, uh, uh, the uh, right to travel, right of access to the courts, and the other explicitly mentioned fundamental rights like those in the First Amendment. Uh, and so uh, uh, if you, you, you form your classification scheme, you have you know, group A and group B, form the scheme, and if the loser group, if you treat them so badly that you impair one of their fundamental rights, then strict scrutiny is going to apply. But if uh, otherwise, that's not a basis for strict scrutiny. The only other basis for strict scrutiny is the classification scheme was suspect. Now, so uh, the rule then is that the, uh, in cases of minimal scrutiny, that the, 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 the uh, classification scheme must be a rational way to promote a legitimate governmental interest. Legitimate governmental interest will be hypothesized. Rational basis simply the legislature need to have believed that it was rational at the time. Finally, we come to this fourth category here, the rational with a bite. And, and this happens in, in uh, a few cases now. Be very careful with this because the legislature, pardon me, the Supreme Court has never said They've never said that we're using rational with a bite. Okay? Only the writers have talked about it like that. So when you use it in a bar exam answer, point out that, you know, uh, that some writers uh, view this as rational with a bite, something like that. And what happens here is that 
there are some situations where it is, appears that the legislature is really just trying to dump on some unpopular group. And the court dealt with that by saying, what you, the legislature, are doing is not even rational. Now, some examples, here are three examples of that. One example is a Colorado uh, amendment to the Colorado Constitution where it said uh, the, the Colorado uh, uh, legislature does not have the power to pass laws to protect the rights of gay people. Now, I mean, that's almost laughable, but uh, that's what was, that the, the, by, by popular vote, the Colorado Constitution was amended to take that power away from the legislature. And the court said, hey, look, all you people are doing is trying to dump on uh, some, an unpopular group. And that uh, although what you're doing uh, in order to pass the rational basis, now, again, you'd apply a rational basis test because the gay group is not, you know, suspect criteria, and uh, the, uh, you're, you're not impairing a fundamental right, and are, you are not, uh, uh, this is no middle tier, there's no middle tier here. And so the only thing that the legislation or the, the rule had to be was rational. And you could make an argument that it was rational, and I don't think it is, but you could make an argument. But the court said, look, all you people really trying to do is to dump on this unpopular group. And we say that trying to take away from the legislature the power to provide protective legislation for people who might need it, that isn't even rational. And so uh, that's kind of an example of rational with a bite. Another example of that is a, a, a case, uh, uh, the, the Department of Agriculture versus uh, 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 Moreno. And uh, in that case, uh, the, the court, what had happened is that the, the, the uh, state, the, the government had put out some food stamps and the, the, this, the state of Maryland, who was doing the distribution of these, said, uh, we're adding to the food stamp program rule that we will only give these food stamps to households. We will not give the food stamps to a household if there's anybody in the household who isn't related to somebody, to the other people there. So relatives only is what they're saying. And the court said, hey, look, what you're really trying to do, because it was apparent from the legislation, that what they're really trying to do was, was anti-hippie. And the court said that that wasn't even rational. Another example of that is a case where uh, uh, the, the city of Claiborne, you probably know the case, where the city had a rule that says, if you want to have a home for the mentally retarded, you got to get a special permit. But you could have a home for, you could have a hospital, you could have a nursing home, you could have any other, other kinds of medical facilities, but you couldn't have a home for the mentally retarded without getting the special permit. And the court said that, you know, that really is just an attempt to dump on the mentally ill, and therefore uh, you, uh, it wasn't even rational to do that. Now, obviously, you can make a case for any of these being, uh, you know, rationally serving some kind of legitimate governmental purpose, uh, but the court took these uh, as being irrational primarily because they really, the legislation, it was clear from the history that they really, the legislature had a bad motive. So these are the rules of how a rational basis test is used. What we need is lots of examples because if you've got lots of examples, you'll know what to do with the questions when they show up on the bar. And here's a whole bunch of examples and let's take a look at them. Now, Let's look at these examples, and for each example, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this board and uh, see, does strict scrutiny apply? Strict scrutiny applies if there's a suspect criteria, race or national origin. Uh, suspect, strict scrutiny applies if, you, if what you do to the loser group impairs their fundamental rights, and here are the fundamental rights. Middle tier scrutiny applies if it's a quasi-suspect criteria, which is gender or legitimacy, and otherwise rational basis applies. It's like a default position. So looking here then at these examples, these are real cases, and this is where bar exam questions come from. First of all, let's take the one 
with the no plastic bottles, the Minnesota case. I told you about that one. Basically, the court was, I mean, the legislature was wrong when they thought that eliminating milk from milk from uh, plastic cartons would improve the environment. It turns out that you could prove that they were wrong, but nevertheless, it stood because the legislature could rationally believe that they were promoting health, safety, or welfare, or morals at the time that it was passed. In that case, the no plastic bottles, what you would do is you'd say, uh, should, we apply suspect, should we apply strict scrutiny to this rule that you can't put milk in plastic bottles? Uh, should we apply uh, strict scrutiny? Well, there's no suspect criteria involved here. There's no race or national origin involved. We're not impairing the fundamental rights of the losers. We're not implying the fundamental rights are the right to vote, right to travel, access to courts, and any of the other explicitly mentioned fundamental rights, mostly in the First Amendment. We don't have any of that regarding the, the milk, cartons of milk. Uh, middle tier, we don't have suspect, we don't quasi-suspect criteria because we don't have gender or legitimacy. So therefore, you apply a rational basis, and you apply a rational basis, and the question becomes, does this Minnesota law pass the rational basis test? And, uh, and the answer is yes, because the, the legislature was trying to achieve a legitimate governmental goal, environmental protection, uh, which promotes welfare of everyone, uh, uh, and that they thought it was rationally related to that. Next example, eyeglasses. This is an Oklahoma case. It's now, in the eyeglass world, the ophthalmologist is the MD who studies, who specializes in the eye. And the optician is the person that you go to just to get, you know, a, a prescription for glasses. And the optician is the person who grinds the lens. And Oklahoma passed a law saying the opticians who grind the lens cannot do so, uh, you know, for pay, uh, without a prescription. And the opticians sued, saying, hey, look, you can go to the drugstore any day you want to, and you can buy all kinds of lenses of whatever power you want, and you don't need a prescription for that, and you're making us, you know, we can't grind them without a prescription. That's ridiculous. Uh, so does this law violate uh, equal protection? Well, you've got to decide what level of scrutiny to apply. What's our classification scheme? Our classification scheme are the opticians who grind glasses with a prescription and those who grind them without a prescription are going to be treated differently. So do we have a suspect criteria? Certainly not. Are we impairing a fundamental right? No, just you, you can't grind the lenses for pay. Uh, and these are the fundamental rights. We're not impairing the right to vote, right to travel, access to courts, or any other explicit fundamental rights. Middle tier doesn't apply to these opticians, so you apply a rational basis. This is literally what you need to say on the bar exam. So you, uh, here, if you apply a rational basis, uh, is what is the, the rule of law a rational way to promote a legitimate government interest? Well, what interest might the government hypothetically have been trying to advance when it says you can't grind these lens without a uh, prescription. And you can uh, make an argument that they were protecting people's eyes because uh, they, they want people to get the right uh, eyeglasses. Uh, and with that purpose in mind, that's a rational purpose, this uh, is a rational way to advance that purpose and therefore this rule about the opticians not being able to grind glasses for pay without a prescription is, uh, does not violate equal protection. No sale of ad space on the side of the trucks. We talked about that before, where New York had a law that says you can put ads for your own business on the side of the truck, but you can't hire your truck out and put ads of somebody else on the side of the truck. And so what do you say to the bar exam? You'd say, well, what's the, what's the classification scheme? The classification scheme is, is the ad on the side of the truck yours or somebody else's? Uh, and so... Is, is there a suspect criteria? Seven, heavens no, the suspect criteria are race and national origin. We don't have that. Uh, are we impairing any fundamental rights of the losers? Well, the losers can't put the signs on the side of their trucks. We're not impairing their right to vote, right to travel, access to courts, or any other explicit first uh, fundamental rights. And therefore, we have no basis for using strict scrutiny, middle tier. We don't have gender or legitimacy. Therefore, you use, uh, you use a rational basis. Using rational basis over here, uh, did the court uh, in passing this law that you can't have other people's ads on the side of your truck, 
is that a rational way to promote a legitimate governmental interest, legitimate government interest is safety, and this is a, a certainly the court, the, the legislature could have reasonably believed that this would promote safety. Next example, no food stamp for strikers. This is a case, uh, a federal case, where there were some people who were on strike and they wanted to get food stamps because they didn't have any income. And there are other people who didn't have a job and didn't have any income. And the, court, the, uh, the uh, uh, food stamp uh, people said, no, we won't give food stamps to those people who got jobs in their own strike. And so does that violate equal protection? Well, let's take a look. Uh, should you apply strict scrutiny? The criteria is not race or national origin. The, uh, uh, the uh, 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 doesn't impair any fundamental rights of the, of the losers. People who can't get the food stamps, you're not impairing their right to vote, right to travel, access to courts, any other explicit fundamental rights, mostly in the First Amendment. Uh, you don't have a middle tier because they're not discriminating against the strikers and non-strikers based on gender or legitimacy. Therefore, you use rational basis. If you're going to use rational basis, is the food stamp uh, rule uh, where you don't give food stamps to strikers, but you do to the non-strikers. Is that a rational way to promote a legitimate governmental interest? What's the interest that's being promoted? Well, the interest that's being promoted is for the government to appear to be neutral in these private strikes. And this is the federal government now, so you've got to look to the federal constitution to see what purpose they might have had. In this case, you look to Commerce Clause because the labor is a part of the Commerce Clause and under, you, you, you want to appear neutral in the strikes that would help to promote, you know, uh, 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 reduce strife and labor. You don't want the government choosing sides. And therefore, it's part of the Commerce Clause to promote labor, good labor relations. And therefore, this does not violate equal protection. Unequal educational expenditure. This is the Texas law. This is the Texas law, the Rodriguez case. This is the Texas law that says, look, uh, th these people, were collecting taxes in this area and spending that tax money on the students in this area. Next area, you collect taxes from this district and you spend the tax money on the students here. So the poor neighborhoods weren't getting much tax money and they weren't getting much in the way of good schools. And so the people who weren't getting much in the way of good schools filed a lawsuit saying, violating our equal protection rights. Well, let's see. Does unequal expenditure of school funds in this way violate equal protection. What's, what level of scrutiny shall we use? Strict scrutiny? Nope, this is not race or national origin. Now the people who are not getting the benefits of this might very well have said, well look, the poor folks are minorities and this really amounts to discrimination against the minorities. But if you do that, the people who are claiming that this amounts to discrimination against minority would have to prove with the preponderance of the evidence that that was the intent of that legislation. They, they did this with the intent to discriminate against minorities. And, and if you can prove that, then you can use strict scrutiny. But if you can't prove that, you can't. Uh, they couldn't prove it, and so we don't have suspect criteria. It uh, doesn't impair any fundamental rights. The fundamental rights are right to vote, right to travel, access to courts, uh, other explicit fundamental rights, mostly in the First Amendment. Uh, the criteria did not use gender or legitimacy. Therefore, we use rational basis. And so as using the rational basis test, the state of Texas or this district in Texas was uh, running their school education system in that way, whatever you might not like about it, uh, it is a rational way to promote a legitimate governmental interest. What is the legitimate governmental interest of, of, of I don't know, make up one to uh, uh, you know, have the local communities fund their own schools or something, that's probably rational. And so uh, this did not violate equal protection. No methadone for bus drivers in New York. New York had a rule that says if you're a methadone user, you can't drive one of our public transportation buses. And uh, so uh, the people who were methadone users said, hey, violation of equal protection because there are lots of other people out there on all kinds of other drugs, and you don't have a rule that says the people who use aspirins can't uh, drive the buses. So what's wrong with methadone? And so let's see, what, uh, to decide whether or not a rule that says if you're a methadone user, you can't get a job driving the New York City buses, what level of scrutiny shall we apply? Suspect criteria? No, not race or national origin. If most of the bus drivers who were the victim of this were minorities, uh, and they claim that this really amounted to a discrimination against minority, they'd have to prove that the rule was created with the intent 
to discriminate against minorities. You don't have that. It doesn't impair any fundamental rights because the fundamental rights are these, right to vote, right to travel, access to courts, other explicit for fundamental rights. And they're just, they're just not giving these people a job. They're not impairing any of their fundamental rights. Middle tier won't work, rational basis. So you, and you say this, what I just said to the bar examiners, I'm repeating it over and over, this is exactly what I would like for you to say to the bar examiners. In this case then, the methadone users, are we going to use rational basis, and so is not allowing methadone users to drive public buses, transportation buses, is that a rational way to promote a legitimate government interest? What's a legitimate government interest? You can make a case for safety, and it doesn't have to be the real purpose. Any lawful purpose will do. Make it up. Uh, and so safety will do. Is this a rational way to promote safety? Well, yeah, because some methadone users go back to using heroin. There's a certain percentage that do that, and the, the city can say, we don't want to take that chance. So a methadone rule does not violate equal protection. Uh, the Social Security nine-year rule says if you're married to someone less than nine years, you don't get their death benefits if they die. More than nine years, you do. And so uh, someone filed a lawsuit claiming violation of equal protection. Does this violate equal protection? Well, let's see what level of scrutiny shall we use. Suspect isn't going to work. Doesn't impair any fundamental rights. None of these fundamental rights are impaired against the loser middle tier. This was not based on gender or legitimacy. Therefore, you've got to use rational basis. If you're going to use rational basis, does the government have a rational reason for the nine-year rule? Yes, it prevents fraud in the Social Security system, and this is certainly a rational way to do that. I'm summarizing now, so I don't repeat myself too much, but you've got to spell this out, that, you know, explain why the nine-year rule would help to prevent fraud and how this is a rational way to preve uh, that, uh, that preventing fraud is a uh, legitimate governmental purpose and that, uh, by the way, the pre prevention of fraud in the Social Security system is a legitimate governmental purpose because the federal government, although it cannot regulate for the general welfare, it can spend for the general welfare, and it's going to spend. It can certainly prevent that money from being uh, spent fraudulently. Uh, Maryland uh, had a rule that uh, they, they, there was a federal food stamp program, and Maryland added to that program saying, look, uh, we are on it. we're going to administer the money by the family. That is, you can give a family a certain amount of money, but if they have more children in the family, we are not going to give them extra money for having more children. Now, uh, the, uh, and so uh, the people with more children say, hey, we're getting less money per child, violation of equal protection. Well, let's see. Does it violate equal protection? Strict scrutiny? Nope. Not race, not national origin. Impair any fundamental rights, right to vote, right to travel, none of this stuff here. Um, they might claim that you're violating their right to procreate, but this is not true because uh, the government is simply saying, we, we'll only, you, can, you can procreate as much as you want to. We don't have to support all your procreations, and here's how much we're willing to support, so we're not impairing their right to procreate. Uh, suspect, a middle tier, we don't have gender legitimacy, rational basis. If you're going to use rational basis over here, the fixed benefits per family, using a rational basis. Is this a rational way to promote some legitimate governmental interest? Well, what's a good legitimate governmental interest? Um, um, the, uh, uh, I don't know, to make up one for distributing by family rather than by, uh, uh, by individual. Uh, the, I don't, don't have one right now, but you can certainly think of one. Uh, and, and then this is a rational way to carry that out. So, sorry, I can't think of an example right now, but you can think of one. Proposition 13, this is the California statute that says that uh, tax base, uh, the taxes on real estate should be based on the selling value of the property. And so if you bought your property a long time ago, 20, 30 years ago, and haven't resold it, then your tax base is still going to be based on that old value. And even, whereas if you sold it to somebody, the tax base would be based on the new sale value. So you end up with homes right next door to each other in California where one is paying taxes on a basis that's 20, 30 years old because the place hasn't been sold, and the place next door just got sold yesterday, and it sold for maybe 10 times the value of the place uh, next door to it, so the tax is going to be higher. So you keep the places right next door to each other with a tax rate that's dramatically different. 
and the courts, uh, and so the people who were had to pay the higher tax rate sued. California is a case about, about that, and uh, the, uh, the 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 court said, you know, the court has says the state. This is, first of all, they go through this and say, what level of scrutiny shall you apply? Not strict scrutiny for either of these reasons. Not middle tier rational basis. Rational basis. The state might be trying to promote uh, stability in homeowners. You know, a stability in communities. That's getting pretty thin, but that was the argument. Uh, and that that's a rational thing for the state to do, and this is a rational way to do it. So Proposition 13 did not violate equal protection. Please notice that in each of these cases, we're looking at the classification scheme. We're distinguishing between the people who bought their home recently and the people who bought their home a long time ago. And is making a difference between those two people a rational way to promote stability in, home, in, uh, in neighborhoods? And the answer is, yeah, sure. Police retirement at age 50, Massachusetts rule says, you know, you get to be age 50, you got to retire. People who are over age 50 didn't want to retire, brought a suit, equal protection. What standards shall you use? Not strict scrutiny, obviously. Not middle tier, obviously. Rational basis. And uh, the rational basis, uh, the rational basis might have been that we want a fit police department. Now, I realize that there's some people over 50 who are fit. But that's not the point. We're not taking their jobs away from them. We're simply saying you're, you have a job until you're age 50. After that, you don't have a job anymore. And so uh, the, uh, this, re this requirement that people retire at age 50 is, uh, promotes a legitimate governmental interest, uh, a, a healthy and agile police department, and this is a rational way to do it. That's all you need. Uh, we have a case in New York. New York says you cannot teach in the public schools if you're eligible for citizenship and you don't apply. So if you're eligible to get your citizenship and you say, I don't want to be a citizen, then the New York school system says, well, you can't teach here. Now, this is not discriminating against aliens. It's, uh, it's simply saying if you don't want to be a citizen, that's different. You, if you could be a citizen and you don't want to be one, we don't want you teaching in our schools because part of what you have to teach in our schools, particularly for young children, is a sense of national uh, interest, national, uh, uh, some, some loyalty to your national country. And so this did not violate equal protection. Why? You go through this. What scrutiny shall you use? Uh, you don't have race or national origin. You're not impairing any of the fundamental rights of these people. You're just talking about their jobs. So you don't, you're not impairing their right to vote, travel, access to courts, other explicit constitutional rights. Quasi-contract, quasi-suspect criteria we're not doing on the basis of gender. You use a rational basis. Does the state have a, is this, have a rational reason? And yes, and is this a, re, a rational way to promote their legitimate governmental purpose? And the answer is yes. New Orleans had a law about push carts in the French Quarter. And so there were getting to be too many push carts in the French Quarter. This big place wasn't looking like a French Quarter anymore. It looked like a push cart quarter. And so the, the court, the, the, uh, uh, the Louisiana legislature says, here's what we're going to do. It says the people who have had the push carts in the French Quarter for eight years or more, you can continue to have your push carts there. It's part of the flavor of that community in New Orleans. But the newcomers who less than eight years, you can't have your push carts there anymore. So obviously you have a difference in treatment. And what's the classification scheme? Those people who've been had their push carts in the French quarters for eight years or more, and those who haven't. Is that classification a suspect criteria? No. Does it impair any fundamental rights? No. The fundamental rights are right here. Vote, travel, access to courts, explicit constitutional rights, First Amendment, no. Middle tier, no. Rational basis, use rational basis. Did Louisiana, is Louisiana trying to achieve a legitimate governmental purpose? Sure, they're trying to achieve a legitimate government purpose. They're trying to maintain the French Quarter so it looks kind of like what they want that attracts tourists and so forth. That's the legitimate governmental purpose and that promotes what? Health? No. Welfare? Probably welfare. It doesn't promote health, welfare, safety, morals. It promotes uh, welfare probably by, by uh, in, in making the place look like they want it to look for tourists. And that brings in money. And so the people who had, had not been, had their push carts there for two years lost 
and it did not violate equal protection. Now you've seen from these numerous examples how this uh, scheme works, and if you work it this way on the bar exam, you get a good grade. Uh, there are, I want to point out uh, one more thing to you, and that is that there are some cases where the court has said that the distinction that you are making isn't even rational. Now that gets hard to find. We know that in those cases where they're saying it's not rational because really the legislature was trying to dump on some unpopular group, you don't have very many of those, so don't you know, uh, make more of this than it really should be on the bar exam. Uh, but the only cases I know are the ones I mentioned to you and one other, Plyler versus, Plyler versus Doe, and uh, that's the Texas case where uh, uh, Texas said, uh, we won't spend uh, our uh, money to educate the children of illegal aliens. Well, you know, that's, you, the state has a rational purpose. We don't want to spend our money that way. But the court says, nope, you're basically, and the court didn't say you're dumping on an unpopular group. They never say that, so don't you, don't you act like the court said it. You can point out that, you know, the, the writers are saying that and that, um, in effect, the, the court was saying, look, children of illegal aliens, uh, you know, they didn't choose to come here, and we're making them the victims when they had really had nothing to do with it. They're here because their parents are here. Not only are we making them the victims, they'll be victims forever. You don't educate this child for the first 10, 12 years of their life, they're a victim the rest of their life, and so is the rest of the country, too, probably. But in any event, you can see that the court says, no, this is too much of a burden to impose on people who really had nothing to do with the problem. And so it's not even rational to not educate those people. Those are the only examples I know of where the court says it's just not, uh, it's not rational because it looks like they were dumping on an unpopular group. But there are a bunch of other cases where the court says what the state's doing is not rational. I want you to be aware of these. Take a look at this first one. Uh, these first three here, are the three that I told you about uh, uh, with the uh, uh, no food stamps to a household if there's anybody in there that's not related. Uh, uh, the state of Colorado pro uh, prohibited from passing laws protecting gays. City of Claiborne, people who are mentally retarded. We've talked about how the court has said that's not even rational. Here's another example in Illinois' case. Uh, the Illinois case was a case where uh, Illinois had a rule that says, if you are disabled and you apply for some disability benefits, and if we, the state, don't process your claim within 120 days, you lose your claim. Now that is very ridiculous, and you can see how the court says that's not even rational. Uh, poll taxes, where you gotta pay to vote, the court says, no, 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 no. Now first of all, paying to vote will impair your right to vote, and so strict scrutiny would apply to it. But the court says it's not even rational to, uh, because there's no connection between people being able to pay their poll taxes and their ability to vote intelligently. Choosing an executor of an estate by gender. Idaho had a law that says, you know, if a man and a woman both are available to be the administrator of an estate of a deceased person, by law we prefer the man. And the court says, come on, folks. That's not even rational. Of course, you could apply middle tier and say it, it doesn't meet middle tier scrutiny also, but it's not even rational, let alone middle tier. Alaska, uh, minerals for dividends. Alaska had a rule that says uh, if you are, uh, uh, that we've, we've got a whole bunch of, of resources here, oil mostly, in Alaska that we didn't know we had. And we got all this money in for taxes, and we really don't need it all. So we're going to pass it out to the citizens. But the money we're going to pass out to the citizens is going to depend on how long you've lived here. If you lived here longer, you get more. And the court says, no, 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 no. So that's not even rational. And part of the reason is that it sort of indirectly interferes with the right to travel. Uh, but the court decided that this was not even a rational scheme. Charging higher taxes to out-of-state insurance companies. Alabama had a rule like that. Well, you charge higher taxes to out-of-state insurance companies and what is your legitimate governmental purpose? Uh, well, I guess to raise taxes. Uh, trouble with that is that, you know, corporations 
don't have privileges and immunities. Individuals have privileges and immunities. And corporations don't have right to travel. And so for a corporation, you can't, you can't void the statute on the basis of privileges and immunities or right to travel. And so what the court did in this Alabama case is says that charging the out-of-state insurance companies obviously interferes with interstate commerce and that it's not even rational. And the reason, you want to be a little careful here, the reason it wasn't rational is because um, the, uh, the theory is that uh, if, you, if you have a state law and the whole purpose of the state law is to favor your state over the national economy, that that is considered not even rational. Now, nowadays we don't treat that as not rational. We say if your state law, uh, uh, you know, prefers your state, favors your state over interstate commerce, that strict scrutiny will apply to that is the way we do it nowadays. But in the old days when this was around, we, the rule was more absolute that if you pass the state law that favored your state over the national economy, that that's not even a rational thing to do. And that's how this one got thrown out as not being rational. Denying education to, legal, uh, to children of illegal aliens, we talked about that, that's not rational. Finally, we come to those cases that you know about, but let me refresh your mind again, that in some cases, the state has a rational reason for doing what they're doing, and the person who is injured by that is going to say, yeah, you got a reason, but really what you're doing is discriminating on the basis of gender, on the basis of race, on the basis of national origin. And that's what you're really doing. And the answer is, well, you can claim that if you want to, but you got to prove it. Otherwise, you don't get any place with it. And if you can prove it, that they're discriminating on the basis of race, gender, they can use the standard that goes with that. Uh, police examination, Washington, D.C., the, uh, the people who were not doing well on the examination said, the purpose of the exam really was to keep blacks from becoming a part of the police department. And as the court said, prove it. They couldn't prove the intent. Reapportionment for voting. Alabama had a case, there's several states that have had a case of reapportionment where, you know, you take a district that's large enough to elect somebody to be on the city council, and now the city re rezones this, redistricts it, so that a part of that district is now in District 1, and a part of that district is in District 7, and part is in District 2, and so forth. So and the, these people now who used to be able to elect somebody to represent their interest on the city council can't do it anymore. And so if they say, hey, you broke this up in order to dilute our vote, that's impairing our right to vote. And strict scrutiny applies to that. Of course, says, yep, if you can prove that the purpose of this breakup was to dilute your vote, strict scrutiny will apply. But if you can't prove it, it doesn't. Now, the city's going to say, oh, no, no, we didn't break up this district for that reason. We broke up this district because we've got these economic reasons and, you know, the bus routes and, you know, the stars and the sky and whatever that reason may be. And they, but if, you can, if those reasons sound phony enough, that helps to prove that they weren't legitimate. But in any case, the people who are claiming that the reapportionment was in order to dilute your vote, they got to prove it. Without intent, it doesn't work. Rezoning to allow low-income housing. This was a Virginia case in which uh, there was a community that had a bunch of expensive uh, single-family dwellings, and somebody applied for a permit to put some low-income housing in that district, and they wouldn't give them the permit. And so your distinction is between people who apply for permits for single-family dwellings and those who apply for permits for low-income housing dwelling. And does that uh, in, uh, create strict scrutiny? Nope. No race, national origin in there, middle tier, no rational basis. Thing is that uh, these people said, but your rezone, you're not allowing us to get this permit is really to keep minorities out of that community. And again, if you can prove that that was the intent of that rule, fine. Otherwise, you lose. Veterans' preference, this is the most striking case. Veteran preference for civil service employees. This is a case where Massachusetts had a rule that says, look, you know, we're nice folks, and these veterans who went out and fought our war for us and they want to come back here, they want to get a civil service job, we're going to give them a preference on the civil service exam. We're going to add a bunch of points to whatever score they got on the civil service exam. And so the male veterans, of course, I mean, the veterans are almost all male from World War II, and so they got a big boost of civil service jobs and uh, civil service scores. They got the jobs. Women didn't get the job. Women sued equal protection, and the women said, you're discriminating on the basis of gender. 
And the court says, well, you know, it may turn out that, you know, the women are kind of get hurt more by this than the men do, but you've got to prove that the purpose, the intent of this law was to discriminate against women, couldn't prove that, and so they lost. So I think you see at this point how this equal protection scheme works. You see that uh, uh, when you use rational basis, you, you use it when, middle, when uh, strict scrutiny or middle tier does not apply. When you apply rational basis, that any governmental purpose will do, you can make up one, and the law has to be, the, the classification scheme, the way you group the people, has to be rationally related to achieving that governmental purpose. And, of course, if the, the losers, if you treat the losers so bad that you impair their fundamental rights, you're going to get strict scrutiny out of that. And then finally, we have this case of rational with a bite. And I've given you these examples here, the anti-gay Colorado case, anti-hippie Maryland case, and the anti-mentally retarded people. Uh, and uh, finally, there's also the Playa versus Doe why the, where uh, the, the illegal children of illegal aliens uh, the, uh, were being dumped on, and the court says it's not even rational to not educate those people. Uh, if you do your equal protection analysis, at least the rational basis part, of course, there's separate lectures on middle tier and strict scrutiny. If you do your, ration, you do your rational basis arguments on the way we've talked about, and you've seen lots of examples in the Problems on the bar exam come from these examples, or these kinds of examples. And if you do it this way, you should get a very high score. And this is what the bar examiners want to see from you regarding equal protection analysis. Please do it, get the high score, and uh, that's the end of this lecture.